everyone, uh, this is Matt show with Intro Stats, and today we're talking about two population mean average hypothesis tests. So last time we sort of talked about two population proportion percentage hypothesis tests, and now we're dealing with comparing the mean average of two different populations. So we're going to kind of get into this. Let's start. All right, we said last time that with these advanced hypothesis tests, with these more advanced hypothesis tests, there's sort of four key things to kind of to memorize or at least to know what they are for these tests. So for a two population mean average hypothesis test, uh, we want again, we want to know the null and alternative hypothesis. We want to know what type of data we need for this test. We want to know what the assumptions are. How, you know, how can I make sure that my sample data is good enough to say something about a population? And then what would my, my test statistic be for this test? Okay, so let's get started. The first question. What's the null and alternative hypothesis look like? Okay, so again, uh, H0 or H0 means null hypothesis, a statement about the population that involves equal, to equal or equality. And then we have the alternative hypothesis, which is a statement about the population that does not involve equality. All right, so now we're going to kind of get into a little bit here. Uh, so what would the null and alternative hypothesis look like? Well, obviously we're kind of we're we're comparing a mean average from one population to another. So probably the null hypothesis is going to look like this. We're going to say uh, the null hypothesis would be something like mu one equals mu two, and the alternative might be could be not equal. It could be less than. Could be greater than. Whatever, whatever we're dealing with. So less than mu2. Remember the Greek letter mu is usually used as a population mean average. Um, so again, very similar to what we did in one population mean average tests. So now we're just comparing the mean average for two groups. Now again, um, it's good to know what's the claim. You know, what do the person think is true? What's the claim? Also, uh, kind of think about what. Um, uh, what might what type of test this is if it's a less than remember less than HA always tells you the type of test so HA if it's a less than it looks like an arrow pointing to the left so that's a left tailed test the way I got it written right here this would be a left tailed test okay so a left tailed test so um, alright now the tricky part just like two population proportion that we talked about last time um, this can be written in different ways depending on what you're dealing with. So again, they love to pull this little algebra on you. They subtract mu2 from both sides, and what you get is another alternative way of writing the null and alternative hypothesis. So you could write, if you subtracted the mu2 over from both sides, you'd get this. Mu1 minus mu2 is equal to zero, and mu1 minus mu2 would be less than zero. Now zero is really an important number in two population tests, uh, just like kind of we talked about with two population proportion. Same thing. Uh, a lot of computer programs will say, what's the hypothesized difference? And, and, then, um, and then you'll see that they already put in zero. The reason why is because they're thinking of the null and alternative hypothesis as written this way instead of this way. Now these two ways are both equivalent, they both mean the same thing. But I show you both of them because it depends on what computer program you're looking at, you may see one or the other. Now um, usually this would be the way, uh, one of these two ways would be how you would write it if you're dealing with two separate groups. If you guys remember in our discussions about two population mean confidence intervals, there's sort of two types. We have um, two separate quantitative data sets, two separate samples from two separate populations, and then we also have this idea of a matched pair. Matched pair was very kind of complicated when we talked about it in, in confidence intervals. Um, think of it again, usually it's like the same person measured twice is usually the matched pair, though you can have other kinds of matched pair. But think of it like the same person measured twice. So if you, if you have two separate groups, usually this is going to be how you write the null and alternative hypothesis. It'll be one of these two. This is for when you have a two population mean for separate groups. 
Sometimes you'll see in stat books, they'll say independent groups. So separate independent groups. Okay, then you're probably going to see the null and alternative hypothesis either written like this or like this. Now, what if it was match pair? So what if we had match pair? Well, match pair, again, is a little bit different. Um, they, they, what they end up doing is they, instead of subtracting the sample means, they end up subtracting the individual values of, this, of that person and then have this column of data called the differences. And we kind of talked about differences before with the confidence intervals, but it's basically a, a column of the differences. And so a lot of times what you're dealing with is kind of think of it as mu1 minus mu2, the difference between the population means, or is it the mean of the population difference? And again, it's a little bit of play on, on words, but it's the same idea. But you will see this idea of the mean of the differences. So sometimes you'll see this this notation. They'll write mu d equals zero. That would be the null hypothesis. Null hypothesis. And then the alternative hypothesis would be mu d is less than zero. So again, if the difference was equal to zero, remember what we learned, that would mean that the two populations are equal. Right? And if, the, if the difference was negative, remember we talked about this in confidence intervals, if the difference was negative, that would mean population one is lower than population two, right? That's kind of how you want to think about it. Though it's just had to do how the how the calculation is done. There's a lot of there's a lot more similarities between these things than people want to say. They, they a lot of times they spend a lot of time trying to figure out, oh, these are so different, so different. They are, there is differences, but there's a lot of similarities as well. I, I kind of think of these as almost the same test. It's just schematics and how the data is being run. Um, okay, so uh, let's take a look at us. Uh, we say what type of data do we need for this test, right? Well, it's mean average, right? It's got to be quantitative data. So what kind of data do we need? Well, we're going to need some, we're going to need some, what type of data do, do we need for this test? All right, we're going to need some quantitative data, hopefully some unbiased sample data, right? So we need some relatively unbiased quantitative sample data, so some kind of numerical measurement data from two either ordered, either matched pair or it could be from separate groups. So we could have either separate independent groups or we could be dealing with the matched pair situation where I, I actually collected two bits of data from the same person. Um, so uh, again, you can also have other kinds of matched pair. It's not always just the same person. We could have like a husband, wife. But just remember the first number in the first data set has got to be like a direct link to the first number in the second data set. Second number in the first data set has to be a direct link to the second number in the second data set. That's what we mean by match pair. In math, we call it a one-to-one -one pairing. It's not some generic relationship between the two, two samples. It's a one-to-one -one pairing. That's what match pair means. So a lot of people think something's match pair just because it has some relationship, but that's not what match pair is. All right, so we need some unbiased quantitative data, sample data. Now, this is going to be the key, right? How do I know if it's unbiased? Uh, well, that's really tough. You know, we, we spent a whole half a chapter just de de delving into all the ways that sample data can be messed up. And we already saw that that can lead to making a type 1 or type 2 error. The, the worse our data is, the more, the more likely we could have a problem with thinking something's true about the population that's really not true. So we want to try to make our sample data, we want to make sure our sample data is as good as we can possibly get it. All right, so that moves us right into assumptions, right? That's what assumptions are all about. So very similar to the one population mean assumptions we've done in the past. So, but we're just now checking it for two samples or for matched pair. So for two random samples that are separate, so this would be the separate independent samples we'd want obviously two random samples. 
or two samples that are very representative of the population. Uh, though usually that means a random sample. Um, and then we would want individuals within the samples and between the samples to be independent of each other. We don't want people that are related to each other uh, in the samples because, they, again, they may have similar characteristics. Now, if you're dealing, and then we would want both samples to be, have a sample size of at least 30 or normal. Again, remember we studied that before from the central limit theorem, at least 30 or normal. That's going to make sure that our sampling distribution looks relatively normal, and we can use the t-distribution. Right? That's kind of how we did when we were talking about one population mean confidence intervals and one population mean hypothesis tests. Um, so, same assumptions, really. Now, if I have the matched pair, it's a little trickier, it's a little different, because I'm collecting two bits of data from the same person, or maybe I'm you know, collecting data from a husband, wife, or, or something like that, or... Two, two baseball teams and I'm comparing the right fielder to the right fielder and the, the third baseman to the third baseman and the shortstop to the shortstop and so on like that. But usually it's the same person measured twice. So in that case, obviously it's not going to be independent between the samples because it's the same person or they both play the same position or their husband and wife. So that goes out. But what we still need is the individuals within to be independent. So we need the individuals within to still be independent. Again, our, for matched pair, our you're going to really have one sample size because you're collecting two bits of data. So our sample size will be th at least 30 ordered pairs or the sample uh, differences came out normal. Usually this means the sample differences are normal. I should Let me put that down. So this is for the sample differences. And for the, the independent separate group case, you're just looking at each sample separately. Usually we'd look at a histogram or some other way of judging shape and just make sure it has that normal bell shape. All right. So we, got, we kind of got an idea of the null and alternate hypothesis. We got an idea of what data we need. We got an idea of the assumptions we need to have checked to make sure that we're going to be able to do this test at all. Remember, though, that if it doesn't pass these assumptions, uh, it's really difficult to say something definitive about the population. That's kind of why we need these assumptions. Also, the